All right, so hello everybody and thank you for being here. Uh, welcome to my presentation entitled uh, Utilizing Cook's Classical Model uh, to Assess COVID-19 Forecast Performance in the U.S. Um, and this is for TU Delft seminars and expert judgment. Um, and if everything looks okay, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, so COVID-19 has obviously had a massive impact on the world. Uh, the WHO recently reported that um, they estimated there was uh, about 15 million global excess deaths associated with COVID-19 uh, from 2020 to 2021. Um, that's about 10 million more than reported. Um, the U.S. Uh, officially surpassed 1 million COVID-19 deaths uh, this past May, and that was initially thought to be an absolute worst case scenario, but um, here we are. And then um, the White House in that same month uh, projected that there would be about 100 million uh, infections of COVID-19 uh, this fall and winter if things continue to uh, trend um, the same way as these past two years. Um, so one tool that could be useful in preventing these worst case scenarios um, is COVID-19 forecasting. Um, and there's a lot of benefits that come along with forecasting. Um, it can inform public health decision making. It can serve as a tool to flatten the curve um, associated with infections and mortality and hospitalizations. Um, and they're also highly visible in the media. They've been reported on a lot. Um, I've seen by CNN and the World News. Um, and it, they serve as something that a really effective tool to communicate to the public um, and as to what's going to happen. Um, but also if it's utilized inappropriately, it can have um, a lot of consequences, uh, specifically societal consequences um, in like the political realm and in economics and education. Um, if you overprepare um, and you do like a government shutdown, that's going to have um, an obvious impact on uh, economics and education. And then it can also lead to eventually lead to mistrust in our public health systems. Um, so we don't want that. Um, and um, it's important to consider, okay, what models would we like to rely on um, for forecasting? And there's a ton of data out there, uh, specifically for the US, there's um, over 100 models that are forecasting for uh, COVID-19. And this includes cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. And they're usually providing uh, predictions um, or central estimates with their forecasts, as well as uh, uncertainty estimates. Um, for uh, various geographical regions like county, state, and national level. Um, and there's obviously other models that are doing this for regions outside of the U.S. as well, but today we're just going to focus on the U.S. Um, and so thankfully, um, most model forecasts are being collected into this publicly available data repository uh, set up by the COVID-19 Forecast Hub. Um, so it made it really easy for us to um, gather these forecasts and um, analyze them, which um, we'll get into later. Um, if you go to the CDC's website, um, they have a, a forecast page um, for uh, COVID-19. And you'll see something like this graph over here on the right. This is for like a specific week um, from about this time last year, uh, October 13th, 2021. Um, you can see it has um, with this black line and and dots, either these are the observed uh, mortality um, in the previous weeks. Um, and then it has all these uh, predictions um, and uncertainty estimates for, um, it looks like about like 20 or 25 models here. Um, that's not obviously not 100 models, um, but it's still a lot. And um, it's important to consider, okay, there's a lot of information to decipher here. Which of these models do we think we would like to rely on? Um, and it's it, it's not a decision that I think you can make just from looking at this graph. Um, so you can start to do so if you uh, evaluate uh, the performance of these models and forecasting. Um, that's not something that's readily apparent on the CDC's website. Um, and it's probably not something that uh, most of the public is aware of. Um, you can uh, evaluate performance in um, basically two um, ways. Uh, the first is evaluating the predictive performance of forecasts. 
Um, and this is more concerned with the accuracy and precision of central estimates. Um, and then you can evaluate their probabilistic performance, which is concerned with the, the statistical accuracy um, and the informativeness of their uncertainty estimates, um, which might sound familiar if you know the classical model well. Um, so most studies have uh, focused on predictive performance in the past, but there hasn't really been very many studies uh, published that have focused on probabilistic performance. Um, and so that's what we're gonna be really talking about today, especially because that's really what the classical model covers. But there has been um, one measure that's been used in the past to evaluate probabilistic performance. Um, and in a recent study uh, by the COVID-19 forecast, uh, um, they use this measure weighted interval scoring, uh, which is based off probability interval scoring, um, which might sound familiar to some of you. Um, the scores that are, uh, that um, result from this, um, they lack direct intuitive meaning um, and their coverage rates have drawbacks when considered in rig rigorous statistical hypothesis testing. Um, that's about as much as that I can get into it. Um, I'm not a mathematician by training, but um, Roger and Tina have explored this uh, thoroughly and compared WIS to the classical model um, in our papers. Uh, so not to put them on the spot, but if we wanna talk more about WIS later, uh, we can do so. And maybe Roger and Tina can talk about it a little bit more. Um, but also their paper that was published recently, um, they utilized a disparate set of forecasts and observations, um, which really makes it diff difficult to compare the performance of models um, because one model may have forecasted for a period that was inherently difficult to forecast for. Um, and that may have set their performance back while another model maybe may have not forecasted for that period um, and done better. Um, so I don't think that was exactly the best way to go about things. Um, so we're gonna be focusing on uh, a data set that looks at uh, models forecasting for all the same dates and we're gonna be using a different scoring method. But before we get into that, there's also this thing called ensemble forecasts. Um, these are a combination of model forecasts um, or aggregating um, all the individual model forecasts um, to make one summarized forecast. Um, but an ensemble forecast can also serve as a method of validation. Um, if you're using performance weighting, um, you can get into, okay, which of these models, you know, do we think that we should rely on more and then weight more into um, an ensemble forecast. Um, there's also other ways to uh, produce an ensemble forecast, um, other things that go into producing an ensemble forecast. Uh, there's global and item weighting, um, which if you're familiar with the classical model, again, you might uh, recognize. Uh, we're just going to stick with global weighting because it's easier to explain. Um, and also there wasn't so much of a difference between the two. Um, when we made our own ensemble uh, model with performance weighting with the classical model, um, so we won't focus on item weighting today. And then there's also, um, when you're uh, coming up with this ensemble forecast and you're averaging all the models together, you can either average uh, by quantile or by density. Um, and there's some issues with averaging by quantile, which we can get into on the next slide. Um, so the most prominent ensemble out there is obviously the one that's showcased on the CDC's website. Um, in 2021, this ensemble was equal weighted and quantile averaged. Um, it was basically taking the median uh, at each quantile across all forecasts. And then eventually um, later in the year in 2021, um, they switched to performance weighting with this WIS uh, method. Um, and we're just gonna be focusing on 2021 today um, because that's what our study focuses on. Um, and so there's some issues, um, obviously, with the ensemble design that was there for most of the year. Um, performance weighting, as we know, is typically better than equal weighting. Um, and they also uh, involved quantile averaging, um, which might improve um, the information score, but um, is, it doesn't adequately represent what the modelers actually believe um, as compared to density averaging. Um, and then there's also the aforementioned issues with the, the WIS method. Um, and so if you were looking into this, 
CDC ensemble model, you can just go to the same forecasting page um, and see a graph like this on the right here. Um, this is showing um, the ensemble model along with all the individual models forecasts. Um, and you can see it's, it's pretty much, you know, straight in the middle between all the individual model forecasts. So our main question today, and what we're gonna be talking about more is how can we better evaluate probabilistic performance and also build better ensembles? And so obviously we're gonna be using the classical model to, to do so. Um, and as you know, this method is uh, typically employed in structure expert judgment, but I believe that it can be adapted to a scenario like this. Um, the models in this case would serve as the experts and the forecasts would serve as the judgments. Um, we're going to be using the typical measures of probabilistic performance with the classical model, which is calibration and information. Uh, I'm not going to get too into the methodology here because um, I feel like I might be repeating a lot of things that have been talked about before um, and things that we might already know. Um, and then for the ensembling uh, method, um, we're just going to be using the um, density average CM performance based weights. Um, like one would use in a structured expert judgment study with the classical model. And then the data that we're really going to focus on today, um, we're going to focus on the outcome of incidental mortality. Um, we could focus on cases and hospitalizations, but mortality is, is really the more reliable uh, measure or um, observation that we're getting from states. Um, cases and hospitalizations have been redefined over the last two years in the US um, and states collect them differently. Um, and, and honestly, the, the data is just kind of a mess. Um, and the, more, the mortality data is a little bit more reliable. Um, so we're gonna be using that. Um, we're gonna be focusing on the US um, and specifically states, um, including the District of Columbia, ideally. Um, and then our target forecast period is going to be the week ending four weeks ahead from the forecast date. I know it's kind of a mouthful, um, but um, we could use like um, the next week or two weeks ahead. Um, but we figured that this amount of time was sort of appropriate for if a decision maker um, wanted to enact a policy or, or something. and. Um, it gave them a, an appropriate lead up to do so um, from gaining knowledge of such a forecast. And then we're going to be focusing on just a 2021 year um, and gathering forecast quantiles of 5%, 25%, uh, the median 50%, uh, 75%, and 95%. Um, and we could take more quantiles and get a more complete distribution, but not all models um, provided such detailed information. All, most models did provide these quantiles though. Um, so first in selecting the observed mortality data to um, grade these model forecasts against, um, there's actually a lot of sources for this that you could utilize. Um, in the COVID-19's, uh, the COVID-19 Forecast Hub's repository, they provide data from uh, Johns Hopkins, New York Times, USA Facts, Interestingly, they don't provide the data from the CDC, which I think would be the first place to look. Um, but um, I know that the CDC has had some um, questions as to how reliable their data is. Um, but all these data sources, their observation, their, their counts of mortality um, for each day or each week, they're not exactly the same. Um, so over here on the right, I have like a, a timeline uh, graph with mortality from Johns Hopkins on the top and then CDC on the bottom. And you can see they generally look pretty similar, um, but they're not going to be exactly the same. Um, so we found that there was about 57% of weekly observed mortality counts by state uh, deferring between the CDC and Johns Hopkins. Um, so it's important to decide which of these data sets you're going to use. Um, and we decided to go with the Johns Hopkins data simply because that's what the COVID-19 forecast hub uh, uses for their research. And that's what most modelers use uh, when building their models. Oh, could you say what the vertical axes are on those? I can't read them at all. Oh yeah, um, those are just daily deaths. Yeah, but the numbers, what are they? Uh, let's see. Um, so like the first uh, line is like 1000 and then it's 2000. 
3,000. It says 3K, so. I'm sorry, the upper one? Yeah, the upper one on the CDC is 4K. Oh, it's also 1K and 2K? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no problem. Okay, and so then um, we had a really intricate process of selecting the models. Um, I didn't want to get into all of that here, but so I sort of uh, dumbed it down for this presentation. Um, but obviously we had a lot of models to choose from. Um, there's been 112 models to report forecasts to the COVID hub. Um, when we first started this analysis as of uh, January, 2022. Um, and so we had to figure out how we were going to um, select models from there. Um, our first um, selection criteria was obviously that they needed to forecast incidental uh, mortality four weeks ahead of time. Um, but then we also wanted to um, sort of get a complete data set for the year and that um, we wanted to make sure that they provided forecasts for all months of 2021. Um, it didn't have to be every week, um, but every month at least, um, because the trends change over the course of the year. Um, and they, we also needed them to estimate their predictive uncertainty and specifically uh, report these quantiles that I mentioned before. So we only had 27 of the 112 models that met this criteria. Um, a lot of models either just forecasted cases or hospitalizations, and some models just started and ceased forecasting, you know, um, before 2021 or during it. Um, and so from these 27 models, we decided to remove two because they were just so limited uh, spatially and temporally. And then two of them were also removed for having uh, duplicate forecast data uh, when compared to another model that was um, a part of this set. So we really eventually selected just 23 models. And these 23 models are shown here. Um, these are just their technical names. I don't expect any of you to really recognize any of these, but you might see some institutions that um, you recognize um, from all over. Um, I highlighted one here, and that's the IHMEs model. It's the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation. Um, that one in particular, I think, is um, really important and exciting to explore simply because um, that one has been really all over the news and, and talked about by um, um, journals. Um, so just to visually show our final data set um, over here on the right, uh, on the left axis, you can see the states. On the, on the uh, X axis, you can see the weeks. Um, and then obviously at the top, we chose 23 models. Um, we actually eventually selected uh, 49 states uh, to explore. Um, unfortunately, a lot of models didn't uh, provide forecasts for Hawaii and Washington, DC. Um, and we looked at a total of uh, 1,572 weeks um, across all these states. Um, so that comes out to about 27 to 34 weeks for each of the 49 states. Um, and then in this uh, sort of chart over here, it's showing um, the difference in death rates um, between the different periods. You can see that in the summer, the death rate was a lot lower than in the fall and the winter. Um, and all of these white spaces are just mean that we didn't evaluate um, that week or like state. And then the gray squares are actually um, where realizations were zero or negative. Um, and obviously it's impossible for models to forecast for that. Um, you wouldn't forecast that there was negative deaths. That's just not realistic. Um, so we excluded those as well. Um, a lot of times states will retroactively correct for their mortality counts. Um, and there's just nothing that we can do to control for that. Um, so we just had to deal with it that way. Um, obviously, we would like to have, you know, this chart completely filled out, um, but a complete data set would have just yielded eight models, and two of them were from the COVID-19 forecast hub, and I think three of them were all related to each other in some way, and so that analysis just wouldn't have been as interesting. Um, so to really maximize um, 
you know, how impactful our study would be. Um, this is what we went with. Um, but just out of my own curiosity, I wanted to see how prevalent these models were in the media. Um, so I did a brief literature search in the dimensions, uh, Factiva and ProQuest policy databases. Um, I obviously found that the IHME model was cited and mentioned far more than the others. Um, and we gave every model for our results, um, just a letter in the alphabet, uh, in alphabetical order, just to make it easier to refer to them. Um, so we, you don't really need to know what model is what, um, but model K is the IHME model. And then some of these other models were also mentioned um, a fair amount, but not nearly the same as the IHME model or the CDC's ensemble, really. So now onto our results. Um, we had basically five real major findings. Um, our first finding that I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about three findings for the individual models first. Um, and our first finding was that predictive performance was not indicative of probabilistic performance for these models and vice versa. Um, so for the following slides, um, just pay particular attention to the uh, models B, K, and N. Um, I have them bolded on the next slides as well, um, but you'll see that um, performance really varies between these two uh, um, measures. Um, so here we have, uh, the predictive performance of the individual models in this graph. Um, we didn't really talk about predictive performance, but I think it's important to show for, for this slide. Um, we have accuracy on the x-axis and precision on the y-axis. Um, and then the green lines um, on this chart are really where you want to see your model, uh, where you want to see the model close to. Um, and the blue lines are just the medians across all models. Um, and so for each model here, and they're all colored a little bit differently, it's showing the median score across all states. Um, so it's not showing like the variability in how they're doing, um, but this is like a general summary of how they're doing. Um, and then the models that are colored like pinkish are the more, uh, the models that are more prominent in the media. The models that are orange are not so much. And then model C, is um, this baseline model, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but you can see here that um, the best performing models that are closest to these green lines are uh, models V, K, S, and N. So K, the IHME model is doing pretty well here. Um, and this model N is doing pretty well. Um, but model B is far off to the top right. Um, it's a lot more imprecise and it's a lot more inaccurate than in general, the other models. And then in terms of probabilistic performance, um, we have another graph here. It's a little bit complicated, um, but in this case, we have calibration on the x-axis and information on the y-axis. Um, and we decimally log transformed those values um, just to make it easier to represent graphically. Um, again, uh, the ideal calibration score would be uh, zero in this case with, uh, after decimal log transformation then obviously the higher the information score, the better. Um, and then we also included these um, blue uh, sort of diagonal lines to represent different combined scores um, from the classical model. And that's just calibration times information. Um, we have, you know, the first line on the right is a combined score of one, and then it goes down by a power of 10. Um, so obviously you want to be uh, a little bit closer to the bottom right, or not the bottom right, to the right side, ideally the top right side, because I mean, you have a better information score um, and that would represent that your model is doing better. Um, so here we have on the right side, the models I, U, C, H, N, J, and B are doing pretty well. Um, B in this case actually is um, probabilistically performing well, um, but then you have on the left side where calibration is really poor, uh, models V and K. Um, K is one of the worst models here. Um, and again, that's the IHME model, um, which was pretty surprising to me to see it there after it was doing so predictably well. And then these models U and, uh, uh, O and Q are just completely off the grid. Uh, I think they had like a calibration score of zero. So they were just completely missing the mark with their uncertainty estimates um, and likely providing just way too tight 
uh, intervals. So between these two um, probabilistic and predictive performance, only model N is really performing well on both. Um, so I think that really drives home that um, prob probabilistic performance is just as important to measure as predictive performance. Um, the, another major finding that we had was that overconfidence is still pervasive. I say still because um, there were some other studies in the past who also um, discussed overconfidence in model forecasting. They didn't really explicitly explore it, um, but I think it was more just like an observation that they had from looking at their uncertainty intervals. Um, and I think that's pretty clear here, here in this graph that I just showed. Um, you can see that information is decreasing in general uh, with calibration. And that sort of created this red uh, regression line here with all these models. Um, overconfidence is a common issue in expert judgment. I know that if you were to um, interview uh, or elicit judgments from 10 experts, you would probably get like two or three that weren't really overconfident. Um, and in this case, we have like seven out of 23 models that meet this calibration cutoff of 0 0.05, which sort of serves as like a statistical significance score. Um, that's not so bad in the scheme of things. So I think it's, it's pretty normal. Um, but obviously, these other models could provide wider uh, uncertainty estimates uh, to uh, improve their calibration scores. And then our last real main observation for these individual models was that most of the models performed worse than this naive baseline model. And so the naive baseline model is really just, it's forecasting in the future, it's providing the same forecast every week, and it's just simply based on um, the observations in the past weeks. Um, and there's um, something else that goes into there uh, for generating their uncertainty estimates, but that's really the gist of it. And you can see that it does pretty well, um, especially compared to these other models. So if you're not really meeting this uh, baseline model standard, um, you're, you, I think you have a lot of work to do in improving your models. Um, but um, we were pretty surprised with this. I wasn't expecting this to, to happen with the data that we had. Um, so it's, it's pretty interesting for sure. Kyle, quickly, is the baseline yeah, sure. model also going four weeks ahead or just one week ahead? Yeah, so um, it's it's going four weeks ahead, um, but it's providing the same forecast no matter how many weeks ahead. So even for one week ahead, it's the same thing. All right, it's just for taking next week and forecasting that for the rest of time. Okay. Yep, yep. So things like change, uh, like mortality counts um, kind of increase and decrease um, kind of slowly. So I, I guess, you know, it's not too surprising that um, it's doing fairly well and maybe other models are just over parameterizing or um, just overthinking things a little bit. So as far as the ensemble models go, um, so we generated uh, we have the CDC ensemble that we talked about before. We also created this performance weighted uh, CM ensemble, and then we created an equal weighted uh, density average uh, ensemble as well. And we found that both the CDC and CM ensembles um, exhibited uh, great predictive and probabilistic performance. Um, so I, I have this table over here on the right. Um, it shows you know the accuracy and precision scores as well as the calibration information. Um, you can see in accuracy and precision, they're pretty similar. Um, but then in calibration, the classical model uh, ensemble is doing a lot better than the CDC model. Um, but then in information, the classical model is, is not nearly as informative um, and it's suffering in terms of the combined score um, as far as you know the medians go across all states. So um, over here on the right with this graph, we just added these uh, ensembles to the graph as well as you know their distributions among all states. Um, so this would be like the median, um, like this this would be like um, the 
uh, calibration information score uh, for the state that's at the fifth percentile of their scores. Um, and then we have, we show the 25th and the median and the 75th and the 95th. Um, you can see um, the equal weighted ensemble is not doing as well as the CEC or classical model ensemble. Um, and then we have, we have a line here showing like this 0 0.05 calibration cutoff. Um, and you can see that the CDC model is right up there with some of these best models, but is not always meeting that cutoff. Um, the classical model is always meeting that cutoff um, and far surpassing it, but it's just a lot less informative. And that's why you see it uh, more to the bottom right. So that comes to my next uh, real major observation is that the CDC ensemble was far more informative um, and the CM ensemble was more reliable in terms of uh, statistical accuracy. Um, and so I provided this chart here on the right, which is, um, it says ensemble weights at the top, but it, it should really say calibration scores. Um, but it's providing the calibration scores for each of the ensembles um, by state. Um, and so if you looked at these calibration scores and judged whether they were above this 0 0.05 calibration score cutoff, the CDC ensemble is only meeting this cutoff 75% of the time, and the classical model is meeting it 100% of the time, showing that it's, it's more reliable in terms of calibration. And then the equal weighted model is just far less than that. So, we obviously have some limitations in our analysis. Um, we really considered um, a small set of the possibilities that we could. Um, we just looked at mortality in the week ending four weeks in the future. We could have looked at cases and hospitalizations, um, but we didn't for reasons that I um, previously said. And then we could have looked at uh, different um, uh, times in the future for like um, one week ahead or two week ahead and so on. Um, but we thought four weeks was was um, serving our purpose well enough. Um, and maybe another paper could explore this stuff, this other stuff more thoroughly. Uh, we considered only US states. Um, so it sort of limited, it limits our generalizability a bit. Um, we excluded Hawaii and DC uh, simply because a lot of models didn't forecast for those regions. Um, and then we excluded a lot of weeks, a lot, many of the potential weeks um, that we could have explored. Um, we covered um, about 1,572 weeks out of the possible 2,548. So we just covered about three fifths of the possible data. Um, but unfortunately with, um, you know, how models are forecasting and um, our limitations with the observed mortality counts, um, that's what we were left with. And then we have a bunch of strengths as well. Um, we explicitly detailed a set of inclusion criteria, which not every study that I looked at um, actually did. Um, we evaluated the performance of numerous offsite and invisible models, um, including this IHME model and the CDC ensemble. Um, and the IHME model, we really took great pains to include because um, they actually forecasted irregularly um, and um, they sort of forecasted um, like sometimes like like a day or a, or two like before or after like other models did. Um, so they were like a bit unusual compared to the other models, um, but I thought it was really important to see how they were doing considering that they were just um, all over the news. Um, and then we analyzed a, a large data set for which model forecasts overlap. Um, obviously it could have been larger, um, but I think this is the most uh, impactful uh, data set that we could have. And then we examined both predictive and probabilistic performance uh, where a lot of studies uh, examined only predictive performance. Um, and we introduced a novel approach for evaluating probabilistic performance, uh, which is this classical model method. Um, so in conclusion, if um, you're going to take away two things from this, um, I believe that this analysis demonstrates that the CM can be useful in disciplines outside of expert judgment um, and that it could potentially improve 
both public health decision making and COVID-19 modeling. And that's it for my talk. Um, I just wanna give some special thanks to um, numerous people that were involved in uh, making this study as well as another study that we wrote before this um, that was a little bit more limited in its analysis. Um, so my co-authors for this study, uh, John Evans, Roger Cook, uh, Tina Nane, Ernani Choma, uh, John and Ernani and I are part of the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. Um, and my PhD is actually funded through uh, the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. So I got to give a special shout out to them. Um, and then thank you to TU Delft for hosting these seminars and expert judgment. Um, I also have some other acknowledgements, uh, Willie Aspinall, jo Joni Tuomisto, and um, Jacqueline McDonald Gibson. Um, they were a part of this, uh, an early grant proposal that was involving um, some of these uh, analysis, analyses on the forecast, um, and they provided a lot of um, helpful information um, when we were just starting to do this um, and really sort of guided us and how, like where we ended up today. Um, and then I got to give a special thank you to the COVID-19 Forecast Hub um, for providing this publicly available uh, data repository um, with all the forecasts and mortality uh, observational data sets. Um, and then the CDC for, um, you know, doing its thing and um, providing an easily ac accessible uh, website for um, looking at these forecasts and uh, visually uh, representing them, and then all the modelers uh, for, um, you know, creating these models and, and providing these forecasts over the past about three years now. Um, so this is just my personal information below. Um, I just made a research gate because John recommended that I do that uh, last week. Um, and then this is just uh, where you can find some of the data that we use. Um, this is a link to that data repository. Um, and this is a link to our uh, research code um, that we used for uh, generating our results. Um, and that's it. Thank you so much. And we can move on to uh, questions if we have time. 